Thank you very much, Dr. Sherry, for that generous introduction, and thank each of you for making me feel so welcome. I've enjoyed the evening immensely, and I'm just delighted to be here with you tonight. I, uh, I listened to Dr. Sherry's introduction very carefully, I, and I appreciate her, her uh, comments about my desire to try to create as much of a bipartisan spirit or not. I was going through the airport about a month ago, and I had just taken off my coat and my shoes, and I was about to go through the metal detector, and I was looking at my watch because I was a little late, worried that I wasn't going to get to my plane on time. And just as I was about to go through the metal detector, I, uh, uh, somebody tapped me on the shoulder, and he said, i, I got to ask you, anybody ever tell you you look a lot like that guy, uh, Tom Daschle? <laughs> and I, because I was in a hurry, I just said, yeah, people have said that. <laughs> then he said, doesn't that make you mad? <laughs> so I uh, hope I can get through the, the night without making anybody mad tonight, but I, I, let me just say uh, how, how uh, just appreciative I am of what it is you do. And the awardees tonight, uh, Dr. Margulis and Dr. Johnson, congratulations for the inspiration and the extraordinary leadership that you have given our country in this field for so long. I'm inspired and I'm very grateful to be in the same room as both of you tonight. <laughs> and let me just uh, thank Ron Freeman. He has made this whole experience such a pleasant one. I've enjoyed working with him and his fantastic staff, your staff, and uh, you, you probably know what a good team you've got, uh, but you couldn't do any better. And so I, I want to salute him and I thank him as well for giving me the opportunity to be with you. But let me just say how special it is for me to be in a room of people who have dedicated their lives, as you have, to improving the quality of life and the health of every American. That's what you do. And you cover the entire spectrum of health. And so, for me to have the honor to speak with you tonight and to share some thoughts, whether we agree on every thing I'm going to share with you or not, is something that means a great deal to me. But thank you for doing what you do and for doing it so well. I know that I'm not expressing anything you don't already know, but it is accurate to say that we're going through the most transformational time in health in our nation's history. A transformational time that will change the way health care is provided, the way it's paid for, and the way it's received for all time. It's a time of great opportunity, and in some ways it's a time of great peril. The uncertainty, the instability, the anxiety that is associated with tumultuous times in health will continue for a long time to come. And the one thing that I'm pretty sure of is that anyone who would say, I'm going to continue to be content with the status quo and I'm going to hold true to the status quo, most likely won't survive. This is a time of change. And I always like to talk about the three Ps as we experience this change. The need first to be prepared, to understand the change and to realize how it will affect me and us. Second, the recognition of the importance of partnership. And I must say, this institute and what it is you're attempting to do in such a short period of time with now 1,200 members clearly demonstrates to me you understand partnership. And the third is pragmatism, a recognition that as this change occurs, and as we try to grapple with all of the many, many challenges associated with it, we can't make the perfect the enemy of the good. We've got to understand that adapting as time goes on with an appreciation for pragmatism is critical. Something tells me you understand that pretty well also. But in spite of the transformation, and all the change that we have experienced and will experience in the months and years ahead, 
I would argue that the current infrastructure, the current design, the character of our healthcare marketplace isn't going to change. If you consider a system as having a central decision making and a central administrative authority, America has never had one. We don't have a system. We have a collage of subsystems made up primarily of five public and private entities. 110 million people are enrolled in the Medicare and Medicaid programs. That's the public system. 150 million people are enrolled in private insurance of all kinds. About 8 million people in an entitlement system for health what we commonly call the Veterans Administration and the Indian Health Service. And then we've got 50 million people who receive today uncompensated care. That's the fifth system. These subsystems, this collage, is really our strength as well as our weakness. This collage has produced an enormous amount of innovation, arguably, not even arguably, more innovation than any other country in the world. You're at the cutting edge, a lot of this innovation. But we've also created silos within our marketplace. Silos that sometimes don't allow for the interaction and the coordination and the kind of efficiency that comes in a, quote, system. And so as we grapple with this new marketplace as it is transformed, the question is, what will it look like and how will it affect all of us and what should we do as we experience it? Well, I want to talk just for a little while tonight about some of this. And as I do, I'd make three observations that I, I think is a statement of fact, but I, I would uh, acknowledge that there may some, be somebody who disagrees. My three observations would be these. That when one thinks of Washington today, I think most people think of health as one of the most polarized areas of public policy there is in the country right now. That there is virtually nothing for which there is any agreement. Well, I, I actually don't believe that. I spend a lot of time on the road with my colleague Bill Frist and Tommy Thompson and Trent Lott and Bob Dole. And I'm really surprised oftentimes at the, the level of agreement between conservatives and liberals and Republicans and Democrats on many aspects with, of, 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 of public policy today and of, of our health care sector in the marketplace. I would argue that there really isn't a lot of disagreement, philosophically or otherwise, that really have, we have three basic categories of challenges in health today. Do we have an access problem? We do. Do we have a cost problem? Well, we spend, we're going to spend $35 trillion on health in the next decade. That's more than the next 10 countries in the world combined. More than the GDP of either India or Russia or Brazil. But I think one of the more troubling aspects of cost, as I see it, for our country, as we spend about $9,000 for every man, woman, and child in the country in taxes, premiums, and out-of-pocket expenses, what I see is the biggest problem is the growth. When I was born, health care was 4% of the GDP. When my children were born, it was 8%. When my grandchildren were born, it was 16%. And a year ago, the Council of Economic Advisors said, if I'm lucky enough to have great-grandchildren, it'll be 32% of GDP. No one can look at that cost growth and not believe that we can't sustain that degree of incline indefinitely. So we have some cost issues. And the irony is, that the more it costs, the more the trends show that quality is declining in this country. We don't make even the top 20 in most of the criteria by which one judges performance today, largely because of the silos 
and because of the many, many other challenges we face in the marketplace today. And so there's little disagreement, it seems to me, among those who concern themselves with the direction health and our health marketplace is taking about what it means for the future if we don't look at cost, access, and quality. There's even, I would say, general agreement about what the causes are. We have a volume-driven system based in part on our fee-for-service payment mechanisms. We have unnecessary care estimated to be somewhere in the six to seven hundred billion dollar range per year, partly because of defensive medicine, partly because drugs are advertised on television, partly because, to a large extent, we have so little transparency about cost and people don't have skin in the game. That lack of transparency is something as well that I think is generally viewed as a, a real challenge in healthcare today. The health sector, when you think about it, is the only sector of the economy where at the time of purchase you don't know what it's going to cost or who's going to pay. And so the lack of transparency has led to costs associated with care that people simply can't get their arms around. We have a lack of coordination, especially with chronic illness. There's an end-of-life culture that most people refuse to address. And we have fraud and abuse, basically theft within our marketplace that is fairly pervasive. About those causes, there is also very little disagreement. And finally, I would argue, and here there may be some difference of opinion, I would argue that if you were to articulate what is our goal, what are we trying to do in health today, that most people would not disagree with the very succinct statement that what we want to do in health is produce a high performance, high value healthcare marketplace with better access, better quality, and lower cost. That that goal is one that might unite us. High performance, high value, with better access, better quality, and lower cost. So what's the rub? Well, the rub, the general debate, the polarization, the confrontation, the politics, enter in as soon as you ask the question, so what should the role of government be in achieving that goal? And that is where all comity and all division all comity breaks down and all division begins. Well, the, the Affordable Care Act was designed to address the causes, to try to begin moving towards that goal with a recognition there was zero agreement on that question about the role of government. And that dispute, that debate has been going on ever since the Affordable Care Act was passed three years ago. But there were two seminal events that occurred last year that, of course, you're all aware of that had a fairly profound effect on the decisions with regard to the role of government in the short term. The first of the seminal events was, of course, the Supreme Court decision just about one year ago today, a decision that allowed for the constitutionality question about the Affordable Care Act to be clarified, and a decision about the expansion of Medicaid leaving it largely to the states. There is some misconception about that court decision that I'm sure given the experience in this room you're all aware of. This wasn't the first time we decided in the courts on the constitutionality of a mandate. That was decided with Part A in, in, in 1972. We have a mandate for hospital insurance. But it was the taxation authority within the Constitution that Congress used to pass that mandate. They didn't use the Commerce Clause, which was used in this case. And as a result, what the court decided was that on a five to four decision, I might emphasize, 
that the Commerce Clause was not an appropriate means to mandate the, the Affordable Care Act and hospital coverage had it been used in 1972, but that the tax authority given the Congress was. Kind of a constrained argument, but nonetheless, that issue for the moment is behind us. The second issue, the second seminal event occurred, of course, with the election itself, because you had two candidates with very distinct and different positions with regard to the role of government in health going forward. So as we look to the balance, now that those two seminal moments are behind us, and we look to 2013 and 2014, and that period going forward, and as we look at the aspirations of our country to address cost, access, and quality, the real question is, so now what? Where will all this lead? And what will happen as we try to understand the effects of this transformation on what it is we do? Well, I would argue that there are four specific areas that we're going to see health policy play out over the course of the next at least 10 years. But in particular, for the next 24 to 36 months, this rollout is going to be very intense. The first level will continue to be the courts. There are about a half a dozen court cases that are still pending. Cases involving contraception, the IPAB, Independent Payment Advisory Board, the mandate, reimbursement in certain cases, there are a half a dozen different categories of legal questions that are still being considered and ultimately will be resolved as we go through the course of the next at least 24 months. So that is the first level upon which there's going to be some very significant, potentially, factors that will weigh in to this transformational moment. The second is probably in some ways the most expansive. And that is the administrative and the regulatory framework and infrastructure that will be built and is now currently being built as we experience the implementation of the Affordable Care Act and way beyond that, the extraordinary changes that we're now seeing across the country. And they really fit in three major components. The first is the one that has probably received the greatest degree of attention and will probably be the most well-developed uh, as we consider what will occur over the course of the next 12 months, and that's insurance reform. We have seen a number of new changes already, including new insurance protections. Insurance companies no longer have the ability to drop somebody. You can't put limits, lifetime or annual limits, on insurance policies. We will have community ratings. People aren't going to be required to pay, pay, uh, pay premiums on the basis of their health. A whole array of new protections, including the right of young people under the age of 26 to enroll in their parents' plans. Ten categories of care coverage that will be kicked in beginning October 1st and implemented officially on January 1st, including for the first time preventative, dental, and mental health. Four levels of actuarial values. The bronze at 60% of actuarial value, the silver at 70%, at, uh, gold at 80, and platinum at 90%. And it is everyone's choice in each, uh, in each state to pick the actuarial value and the, the amount of coverage that they want. And probably the single biggest infrastructural development will be the exchanges themselves, October 1st and January 1st of 2014. The second component of the administrative and regulatory uh, 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 level of change and implementation involves payment reform. And here we're going to see a, a, an exorable, I would say, an exorable trend away from fee-for-service toward bundled, capitated, and, approach, and, and, uh, and, and global approaches to payment that, 
uh, are going to be the subject of a good deal of thought and study and, and, uh, and, and pilot development uh, over the course of the next 36 months in particular. Many, maybe most, of the services provided in clinical and hospital settings could be contracted out as a result of these new payment mechanisms. The third component is delivery reform. And here is where I think all of you will probably be the most directly affected. Delivery reform will certainly include the creation of even more accountable care organizations. There will be evidence-based approaches to care with a significant emphasis on value and outcomes per dollars expended. The real effort will be to create more opportunities to evaluate and ultimately reward value over volume. That is not easy. And that is not something that anyone can say today with any clarity or confidence that they've figured out how we're going to do that. But clearly that is the direction that as I travel the country and talk to policymakers and others that this country is moving towards. The third level of change will occur in what is happening at the, in the states. Each of you will have your own experiences with your own state organizations. As you know, there are three exchange models. There are 26 exchanges that will be run by the states themselves right now. There are 17 that will be run by the federal, uh, the, 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 largely the Department of Health and Human Services, but it will not be evident as you enter the exchange and engage with the exchange that it is a federal system. It will be a state system run by the Department of Health and Human Services. And then there will be seven that will be partnerships between the federal government and the states. Three models, all working differently, all with different uh, requirements and different characters and ultimately a, a, a different approach. Actually, I think it's really one of the strengths of the exchange concept to be able to look at all these different approaches and to determine after some experience and, and, uh, and, and some uh, review just how well they're going to work. So first, the exchanges will be the new marketplaces for health. They expect to see somewhere in the vicinity of 7 to 10 million people enrolled in the first 10 months, and uh, we'll see whether that goal is too ambitious. The second aspect of what is happening in the states, of course, has to do with Medicaid expansion. And there we will see Medicaid expansion currently in 28 states. I fully expect that in most other states, just as we saw with Medicaid originally, when Medicaid was started in 1965, six states signed up. Uh, to be participants. Within 10 years, all 50 states had agreed to participate. That is likely, in my view, to occur with Medicaid expansion as well, but that is only something that, uh, that time will tell. The ACA is the largest single infusion of new health investment in the states in history, and that investment is going to take place in a number of different ways but largely through this exchange and Medicaid expansion infrastructure in, in so many ways. The final critical level is the congressional level. And here we are going to see the polarization play itself out fairly dramatically. Obviously the House feels very strongly in its opposition to the Affordable Care Act and they've attempted to repeal it now 39 times since it was passed three years ago. I don't think there's going to be significant change legislatively in the Affordable Care Act or in health policy generally uh, for the next uh, couple of years. I don't think the votes are there. I don't think the consensus can be reached. Uh, those who support the Affordable Care Act don't want to open it up to amendments, and those who oppose the Affordable Care Act would like either to repeal it entirely or to, uh, to amend it in a way that, uh, that would, in, in, for all intents and purposes, render it uh, uh, without, uh, without any real uh, support. And so the legislative component of the congressional level is not likely to change at all. Where we are going to see change 
is in the budgetary aspects of health at the policy level in Washington. And here there are two approaches that members of Congress will have as choices as they consider budgetary issues and health entitlements going forward. Their first choice is to do what we oftentimes do, something I did with some frequency when I was leader, and I really, uh, it, it, it troubles me to have to acknowledge this, but there were times as we considered our budgets and health, the Congress voted simply to cut and shift, to cut the costs and shift them on to somebody else. And there's no better example of that than medical imaging. We've cut and shifted 12 times in medical imaging just since 2006. And providers and patients and employers were called upon to shoulder the costs. Cutting and shifting federal dollars in health doesn't solve the problem. And it is my hope that Congress, regardless of their philosophical disposition, will realize that all we're doing is exacerbating the problem if we continue to insist on cutting and shifting going forward. How much better it would be to do what I like to call redesign and improve. And I can't think of a better example of redesigning and improving than the ACR Imaging Utilization Management Policy Initiative. It's an excellent illustration of what it means to redesign and improve including your clinical decision support tools and the appropriateness criteria that you've so articulately shared with members of Congress in recent months. It ought to become enacted law because it is the kind of way with which to ensure that we're going to maximize value and reduce costs to the taxpayer and to the country. I was part of a couple of bipartisan efforts, one at the Brookings Institution with Mark McClellan, former CMS director, administrator, and one at the Bipartisan Policy Center with Alice Rivlin and Pete Domenici and Bill Frist. As we looked at ways with which we really could bring about an alternative to the cut and shift approach that's so oftentimes used. And while I wouldn't expect everyone in this room to agree that we could redesign and improve around over-treatment, around the need for greater transparency, around shared savings for both states and positions, around administrative simplification, a recognition of the importance of health IT as we go forward, which I think could be the backbone of a new administrative system in our marketplace, team-based care models ensuring as we build these models that physicians are still given the authority they need, expanded scope of practice with that realization, episode-based payment models, a tort reform mechanism that would say if you subscribe to best practices, you're given safe harbor from lawsuits. That too, I think, could go a long way in reducing costs and emphasis on wellness. It seems to me, as we experience this transformation, that each of you have three primary responsibilities. Three. If we're going to create a high performance, high value healthcare marketplace with better access, better quality, and lower costs, it seems to me the very first priority will always be your patients. Reducing the number of incorrect or inappropriate exams, educating ordering physicians as to what imaging tests are most appropriate for their patients, provide meaningful data to determine the best use of imaging resources in the future, and more consultation and coordination between and among physicians and radiologists. It seems to me that priority, patience, has to be number one. The second priority, it seems to me, has to be your employees, the people who work with and for you. 
quality insurance coverage, access to wellness, facilities and programs, education, a good quality of life. To what extent can we serve as the models, really, for the rest of the country as we say, okay, patients first, but employees second? The third priority seems to me, and here I know I'm preaching to the choir, the third priority has to be your community. What are we doing to improve the health of our community outside of our patient responsibilities? Health education, motivating community wellness, improving quality of life, reaching out, volunteering, making your community more health conscious. There are a lot of controversies involving how we make it through this transformation. And we were talking at our table about many of them. My view is that we aren't going to come to any conclusion, any consensus, certainly no unanimity with regard to the role of government. But my hope is that we can build stronger public-private partnerships in health. That in this marketplace we can tear down the silos, we can find greater models for better coordination, and we can bring the public and the private sectors closer together. We've done it in other areas. We certainly have done it in our banking system. And I'm hopeful that we can do it in health, too. I think there are five tests to survival and success that will affect and ultimately determine how well each of you do. Five tests. I could be wrong. There may be more. There may not be as many as I'm going to describe, but, but I think they fit. The first test is resiliency. There's going to be a lot of bumps in the road. There's going to be a lot of unexpected twists and turns, setbacks, as we experience all of this amazing change. It's going to affect us, and the question is, how resilient will we be? Resiliency will mean a lot in ultimately making the determination as to whether you succeed or you don't. The second is innovation. We are, as I said a moment ago, the most innovative nation in the world. The question is, can we remain so? Can we put the priority on innovation? Can we move away from some of the risk adversity that we find so often, whether it's in the regulators or in the corporations? We need innovation. And you are at the cutting edge of innovation with all of the extraordinary change you yourselves have brought about. The third, well, the third is one that I know you all understand or you wouldn't be here tonight. The third is collaboration. This Leadership Institute is a testament to your recognition of the importance of collaboration. There's an old movie, David Lynch produced it, called The Straight Story. I don't know if you ever saw it. It's a great, great movie about this farmer in his late 80s who heard that his brother, in, he lived in Iowa, his brother lived in Wisconsin. His brother had just learned that he just had a few weeks to live. And so Alvin Strait got the idea that even though he had no money, no car, couldn't even afford a bus, he'd drive his John Deere tractor across the state of Iowa into Wisconsin so he could be, be with his brother before he died. He get in, he'd got in that John Deere lawnmower, lawnmower tractor and started driving across the state of Iowa. He had some hot dogs in his back, uh, back case and he'd be cooking hot dogs every night. One night he was cooking his hot dog on the side of the road and a young woman came out of the brush and she was in big trouble. 
pregnant, all kinds of challenges and problems. As they sat around the campfire, Mr. Strait asked the young woman to pick up a stick, and she did. He asked her to break it, she did. Then he asked her to pick up a bundle of sticks. She couldn't break the bundle. He said, that's family. You could say that's this institute. That together, collaboration make you strong. The fourth is engagement. That test is one that I know Ron knows extremely well. Participation in public policy debate where you lend your voice has never been more important. This organization can't afford to be spectators with all of the decisions being made with regard to public policy and the framework for this new health marketplace. You need 2020 eyesight, and I'm not talking about your physical eyesight. You need interest and involvement in the process. And I would argue that if you don't know the name of the legislative assistant for your congressman, then you probably don't have 2020 eyesight today. We have to be engaged. We can't leave it to others to decide the fate of this extraordinarily important experiment in health in America in the year 2013. Finally, we need leaders. Boy, do we need leaders. And that's probably what brought you to this realization some two years ago, that collecting the leadership and coming together as you have tonight with mutual interests, mutual passions, and a mutual commitment that you could make a difference. We need motivators. We need risk takers. And as I look across this room, that's exactly what I see. There's a wonderful story that I, has always meant a lot to me. And I, I may be, it's just because I, I guess I always grew up with this fascination of our founding fathers and the extraordinary engagement they had and the risks they took and the innovators they were and as resilient as they were the incredible leadership they provided but john adams was sitting in a room with many of them in july of 1774 and he as you may know he was a prolific writer, mostly to his wife. He wrote letters almost daily to his wife when he was away. On this particular day, July 3rd, 1774, as he was sitting in this small room, he wrote to his wife, Abigail, I look around the room and I shake my head. We're deficient in education, in travel, in resources. But there's only us. That's what he said about the Founding Fathers. There's only us. Well, this organization could probably say the same thing. There's only us. Henry Ford said it slightly differently. He said, coming together is a beginning. Keeping together, well, that's progress. Working together, that's success. I think you all know well how to work together and I wish you the great greatest success as you go forward thank you all very much That was really fantastic, and thank you very much. Senator Daschle has agreed to take questions, so if you could make your way back to the microphone, he'll be happy to answer some questions. And um, I would just like to say that we were completely thrilled to have you be here with us tonight and talk about the Affordable Care Act and the future, and thank you, thank you. so much. Thank you very yeah. much. So I can't really see back there. Is there anybody at the microphone? We actually can just see the back of your hand. Okay.
I just have one question. Thank you for the speech. Um, can you can you explain the the working theory about how fee for service is one of the root causes of the healthcare problems? Well, I think the consensus is that a fee for service system can reward volume even when volume may not be in the best interests of a care mechanism. There's a, there's a, if, if you are paid uh, per procedure, the, the, the general sense of the effect of that procedure, uh, especially when cuts are made, um, the, the ability to, for any provider to have to be able to cope with his budgetary issues and the extraordinary challenges that anyone faces in a hospital setting is to a certain extent motivated in part by the number of times any procedure is provided. So you create a, an environment within which a procedure is incented and, uh, and obviously the more you incent, the more you generate an income and the more income you generate, obviously the, the more you may uh, create uh, this unnecessary care dimension of care that most people are looking at today as really one of the biggest challenges we face. But I'd love to have your, your thoughts as to how the logic of that fails. I can't say, sorry. It, it seems discrepant to the way other services are provided in this country at a high level. Uh, I'm, I'm just thinking off the top of my head of other services that are provided that's not fee-for-service? Well, I, I, think the, I think there's been a, a, quite a bit of documentation, actually, with regard to the amount of unnecessary care driven in part. I mean, whether it's self-referral or whether it's uh, uh, any one of a number of, of, of volume-driven measures, the general belief today is that we create an environment whereby we reward volume rather than value. Now that, that's, that, that's certainly not a unanimous view and there are those who strongly disagree. Uh, I think that if, if you look at uh, basically at uh, whether it's um, medical procedures or drugs or any one of a number of different aspects of care today, the, the general sense is that uh, volume is a function of payment. Now, there may be other reasons why volume is also provided. As I said, defensive medicine creates volume that has nothing to do with, with the, uh, uh, the fee-for-service system. But generally, I think there is a consensus, not unanimity, that volume is driven in part by how much one is paid. Um, Senator, I'm, I'm Bib Allen, and I have done economics, as we discussed, for a long time for the college. And one of the things that, um, that, that, that we didn't talk about, and I hope it's not a surprise to you, but how do you see uh, value-based care in the form of capitation being different from where we were in the 90s with sort of the, the capitation redux, and why are ACOs different than capitation redux? Because for radiologists, we either have to get, you know, do what we do on a sort of per service basis. We don't really control um, the patient population per se, so we just have to do, you know, if, if, a, if our referring physician colleagues need imaging consultation, they come to us and, and we provide the answer and we're trying to, as you pointed out, help them with how to appropriately use our service. But in the, in the situation where, you know, your grandson is playing baseball and gets hit in the head and he needs a CT scan because he got knocked out on the thing, it, it's a very much of a perfect opportunity for fee-for-service. I mean, um, my kid didn't hit, get hit with the baseball, so why do I need to, you know, why is that, so that's number, so that's how the, for us, why we think about fee-for-service in those terms. But for us, the only alternative is to how can we take care of a whole population in capitation, and then a lot of people come back and say, well, we've been there, done that. How do you see an affordable care organization being that's, different than capitation? That's a great question, Bib. I, I would say that the single biggest difference is who is running the capitated system. 
in the 90s, it was the insurance companies. Um, the new system has got to be run by the providers. The providers have to have a role. And if the providers have the opportunity to create that new infrastructure and that new organizational ability, um, and only if the providers do it, with a patient-centered approach to care, uh, then I think it can be made to work. But it has to be a provider-driven, capitated approach, not an insurance-driven approach. Senator. Um, our, our profession is very much, as you noted multiple times, uh, uh, in, uh, in innovation, is, innovation is very heavy in the profession. That's why I chose the profession. And I can see how the, um, the Affordable Care Act solves a lot of our problems that we have and how it promulgates best practices. But I, I still have had a hard time defending uh, how it's going to be good for the innovation side in terms of the research and development of new technologies that really are, uh, there's a risk proposition there that, um, that I think that there is some concern we're going to kill, kill the goose that lay in the golden eggs. You know? And that's, um, you know, just from the research side, we see research money drying up and the way that Congress has gone and stuff. I mean, how are we going to incorporate that incentive into the new system where we're really still at the cutting edge and we really start innovating and not losing that to other countries? That is so critical. And I think there are three parts to the answer. First of all, we've got to have the resources. And I'm concerned about the degree to which we're cutting back on resources for innovation today. Secondly, we have to have a regulatory framework that, as I mentioned a moment ago, is not risk adverse, that rewards innovation and, and that we find a balance, really, between safety and innovation. Uh, people are understandably concerned about safety, and, and I think, uh, but unfortunately, I think in some cases we've moved too far in the direction of safety and not enough in the direction of innovation. That's the second. And the third is that I think we've really got to, uh, to provide the, the encouragement uh, for reward uh, by, uh, by uh, uh, patent uh, support, as we did with the drug legislation that was part of ACA. Uh, but we've, there has to be the monetary incentives that come with innovation as well. And I think, to a large extent, um, uh, there is a recognition of that today. I just came. I, I don't know. I'm sure some of you have had the opportunity, like I've had, to come to the, some of the innovation centers of our country. I just spent the week last week uh, in California, in San Francisco and Palo Alto, talking to people in their 20s and 30s just as motivated and, and, and just extremely excited about the things they're doing in health today. I was up in Boston with the same thing, just an amazing number of younger uh, innovators, inventors, um, who, are, uh, who have never been more excited about the prospects for what this can mean for them. So I think that the innovative spirit is alive, and that what we have to do is as much as possible to nourish it uh, at the federal level and, and certainly in our health sector across the country. Uh, if we do that, I think our best days for innovation are still ahead of us. Well, Senator Sheila Moore, I'm from Wisconsin, and um, I have uh, two questions. The first is, uh, there's 10 titles to the ACA, and not one of them, to my knowledge, addresses uh, business and manufacturing as a cause of high cost of medical care in this country. And uh, as someone who has to deal with uh, buying equipment and supplies, I can tell you that the profit margins in many of these con uh, companies are 400% are or 500% or 1,000%. So I, I ask you as a physician, how can I take less and not have fee for service or not get paid for what I do when this whole other side of medicine has unbridled profits? So that's number one, and that's not addressed in the ACA. And then my second question is, my mother just passed away six weeks ago. They wouldn't operate on her because the profit, not the profit margin, but there was only a 10% chance that she would survive but there is a 100% chance that she would pass away if they didn't operate. And I worry about capitation and how that's going to affect our ability to really take care of patients when there's this motivation to keep costs under control and ergo what's considered end-of-life care, which maybe really isn't end-of-life care, uh, is, is not paid for and therefore the care is not given. I was really concerned by that. Well, I think both concerns are very legitimate. And listen, I, I, we're not going to, this isn't going to be solved if everybody 
has has a uh, an appreciation that what is being offered here is detrimental to to the providing the best health for your patients that you can offer. If we can't guarantee that we can improve your life, your working circumstances, and the health and the ultimate disposition of our patients, uh, then this isn't going to work. And so what I tell people is that this Affordable Care Act is really, if this were a football field, we'd be on about the 20-yard line. You've got 80 yards to go, and it can't be the last word with regard to legislation, nor can it be the last word with regard to the innovation that's going to have to come uh, out in our communities uh, from the physicians themselves. And so this has got to be something we do together, uh, not something that's dictated, not something that ultimately uh, uh, creates a win-lose proposition for physicians. Physicians have to feel invested. And if they're not invested, this isn't going to work. Senator uh, Daniel Johnson, I, I first of all want to thank you for being with us tonight and for the outstanding talk that you gave to us. My own personal interest has been for decades in cost of the three issues of cost, access, and quality. And so you might imagine uh, might understand that I was overjoyed when you addressed the, the topic of cost and you mentioned the insulation of the person consuming the services, namely the patient, from the cost of those services because of a lack of transparency. And my question to you is if you've given any thought to the dilemma that the concept of capitation brings to that problem. Because by definition in a capitated system, the person is insulated from the cost of the services and has no idea what they actually cost. And so uh, my secondary question is, can we solve the cost problem if we put into place a system that continues to insulate the person from the cost and has no transparency whatsoever to the consumer of services? Well, Dr. Johnson, I'd say the answer to that is emphatically no. I mean, we number one, we need far greater transparency with regard to the, the costs associated with any given medical experience. But I think secondly, we also have to have some degree of transparency with regard to quality. And what, what these new settings hopefully can be uh, created to do is to create a better understanding on the part of the patient. And I would, I would hope even more responsibility on the part of the patient to take more of that responsibility on themselves. People always ask me, is healthcare a right? Uh, and I'd say, it's not a legal right, but it's a moral right. But along with that moral right comes a very profound responsibility to take care of yourself and to take care of your financial costs to the extent that you have the ability. You can't do that if you don't have the transparent mechanisms to allow you to better understand just what that cost is. And so we've got to create those mechanisms. And as you say, to a certain extent, capitated approaches could mask it if it isn't done in a transparent way. But ultimately, it is going to come down to creating that, that better appreciation, uh, whether it's capitated, bundled, or global, about what those costs incurred on the part of the patient and a part, uh, on the part of other payers really is going to be. It could be enumerated within the capitated uh, account, uh, but somehow that information has to be made available. Brian Potts from Albuquerque, New Mexico. Thank you for the bringing up the point that we have more in common and agreement in that we, we certainly place the primary role of what we do here in this room on the patients and, and that taking care of the patients is the most important thing. That brings a level of trust to this group for the idea of the ACA and the changes that are coming forward. However, that trust is somewhat lost when we we look at recent events in that the CMS is putting a capitation on the number of PET scans that a patient can receive over a lifetime when the ACA would suggest that we shouldn't have a capitation on care. Can that be justified? Well, th th I think we're going to face a lot of these, these questions where there is clearly conflict. And I think the only way we're going to resolve these conflicts is with some experience. I, I, have, I, I have the same concern and the skepticism about um, just how much in conflict those two concepts are, uh, and I think we're going to have to work through them. That's what the pilot projects are about. That's what the, 
the efforts are going to be at the local level to try to work through just how are we going to resolve this and bring some resolution to these obvious conflicts that, that can't be sustained over time. Um, but I don't think anyone has the answer today. What we know is that we've got to work through them, find some resolution, and create an opportunity for this to work a lot better than it's working right now. Well, in conclusion of tonight's program, um, I would like to thank you one last time and offer a small token of our appreciation, and I hope you'll accept this gift from the Radiology Leadership Institute. Thank you very much. And that concludes our program. Thank you.